but then there's some stuff you can do when you do that because now you're done aerating it it's going in the spray tank it's only going to be a few minutes before you put it on the land so it's not going to run out of air right away so what you can do then is add a little fish emulsion which is food and soluble nitrogen and the fish emulsion will grow that to the another level as you're spraying see so we actually put enough fish out to feed the plants too we do two tablespoons to the gallon Break that down. Everybody got that. Two tablespoons to the gallon of fish, two tablespoons to the gallon of maxi crop diluted. You, know, you read the instructions, a little teeny bit makes a, you know, a couple gallons of it, and then we put two tablespoons of that to every gallon. And then we use a quarter teaspoon of Thermax 70, a yucca based spreader sticker, which also the saponins in there are readily digestible by the microbes, so it's, it's sticking to the plant, but the microbes are also feeding on it. Yeah. It also has got readily available sugars that actually relieve stress to plants. It's got, it, it does all kinds of amazing things. You can read about it um, if you go to www.groworganic.com. Peaceful Valley Farm Supply has got a really good description of what it does. So to me, it's the best quality spreader sticker. The fish, by the way, is kind of working like a spreader sticker too. Yeah. And if you didn't have the um, Thermex 70, there's other spreader stickers you could buy. You want to pay attention to if they're certifiable. Some aren't. But you could also use not just um, that, you could also use a little bit of soap and it would work as a spreader sticker also. Something we didn't mention, if your compost tea starts to foam, foam too much, just a teeny bit of vegetable oil will break the surface tension, you won't get yeah. the foams. I did this one project in kind of an orchard and the guy overshot the uh, yucca and as he's going down the oh road, boy. just foam. Pouring out of the pouring out of the sprayer. Well, you overshoot wow. the yucca, the blob, it'll just take you know? over, man. Yeah, yeah. It just it just cranked. He's, what? I said, oh, I forgot to tell you about the oil. <laughs> By the way, you'll also notice that if you use good fish, when you pour it in, the bubbles all go away because it's got oils in it, and the oils are important foods actually. Yeah. yeah. So what you're doing is you, so now you've taken. You know, think about all the steps we did here. You made good compost. You fed it to the worms. You got the extract off the worm through the through the brewer and that's what this is and now you're going to put this out on the land you can add you know a little more food so you've increased the population again then you spray it through the air super aeration they're aerobic organisms they're very happy they land on the leaf surfaces they got foods their population builds they're doing all these functions because you've increased them you've stepped them up from when they were just in the compost pile and there's two kinds of things to think about compost tea leaf surfaces and roots root surfaces. So we might go 50 gallons of the acre drench because we're, we're actually putting it on the ground to drench it to touch the, the roots. The roots have what we call infection sites. They have these little sites where they're putting out simple sugars and carbohydrates to feed beneficial organisms. Well these are the beneficial organisms. You want them in high population so that when the disease comes it can't compete with all the positive organisms. So that's the purpose of tea is to deliver the beneficial organisms and while you're out there, a little bit of soluble nutrient, and, and then you're increasing it by your tank mix and, and your spreader stickers. So then if you use it as a foliar, it's doing the same thing on the leaves if you're lucky. You get it to stick, it's about, they say about 45 minutes. If you get it on there for about 40, 45 minutes before ultraviolet light hits it, it can protect itself and stay pretty much, right? So there you go, timing is, becomes a big deal. You wanna put it out when the sun's not shining, early morning yeah. or evening? Early morning or late afternoon. Right. Because in the middle of the day, you're just frying them. And if you're foliar feeding, you want to spray the undersides of the leaves when the temperatures are in the low 70s, I think, right? The stomata start opening up. Yeah, and it's timing a certain time of day, too. Yeah, but, yeah, time of day. When the birds sing, there's this whole thing called sonic bloom. The plants actually, you know, we're all connected. The birds start singing and the plants go, oh, it's that time. Start opening up their stomatas, you know. The stomatas are nice and open. Then you spray, you get underneath the leaves. That's where the foods go in. Okay, and what about micro damage during your spraying process? There, you, oh, you, want to, you don't want to be sprayed right up against the plant. You want to spray it out so that it no, floats out. As the, as the organisms go through the sprayer and nozzles and so forth. Oh yeah, that's a big deal. There's a whole, that's a whole nother, you can spend a day on that. that. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want, you want, you want big, nozzle you can work with. you want okay. big mister sizes, Pat, maybe have your backpack sprayer around, you can yeah, show them. Sure. The backpack sprayer is great because it just yeah. dribbles the stuff from a big thing in yeah. front of a blast of air. And, the and problem the is if you spray close up then, they're dead. You're smashing. You gotta put them so they decelerate before they land. You gotta spray from a distance, you know? So they wanna float. 
They want to float. They miss, want to yeah, up nice there. miss. They they yeah. land nice and comfortably. If you're spraying right against the plant, boy, they're all just dying. Think garden fairies, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I wish Marsha was here to hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, and then the type of pump. In the old days with the brewers, they had this pump in it, and it has an impeller in it. It was chopping up macerate and fungi. So then they went to diaphragm pumps to pump with it. So a backpack sprayer, that's a diaphragm pump. You don't want an impeller pump. You want a diaphragm pump. So we have a power mister. It's perfect because it'll put out, it'll let large amounts of water hit the mister so it's not getting beaten up by the nozzle. And then if you let it float in, it's totally still fine so it sticks well. The problem is it's kind of a dance to use a big nozzle with a little hand pump sprayer because you're putting big drops out and they just run off. You know? So it's a hard thing to accomplish. If you got a power sprayer and you get a good mist, it works a lot better. You know? But the other thing that happens is you spray that out there, right? You want to get the upper surfaces too. All the surfaces, because just like in the soil, right? They start living on the leaf, right? Elaine, Elaine Ingham says she actually, when she wants to make a new sourdough, she walks out to the garden and gets a different vegetable each time. Because there's life on every vegetable. And she just makes a different starter each time. Well, you want to put your good biology on that leaf. That's how we stopped early blight that year. We just covered the leaves with so much life when the early blight landed, there was no room in the parking lot. And some of the cars ate other cars, which meant that the, the, the pathogens that landed either couldn't park or they got eaten. Right, or you know? sometimes the, uh, the other organisms produce toxins that the pathogen can't stand. You know? Or they just they don't eat as fast and they can't, can't get any food. Yeah. yeah, and the All other those mechanisms. the other research that's out there that's been shown is um, okay. So you got all these critters, much higher population on the leaf surfaces. They're aerobic organisms. They're they're creating carbon dioxide. Mm. More carbon dioxide, leaf stomata open even earlier. So you're actually building a little carbon dioxide plant, right? You know, they're pumping up CO2 right on the leaf surface. And of course, the more carbon dioxide, the plants grow better. Yeah. yeah. What's your frequency of that? We do it at least weekly, and right now, because we... Okay, the thing we haven't really talked about is, we get those microbes out, right? With the food, the fish and the seaweed. All of a sudden, that little bit of fish and seaweed is way more effective. Whenever you use microbial life with even conventional fertilizer, it's way more effective. And this is, I have to give this little vignette in every talk. I, fit it, I haven't fit it into bread yet, I don't think. <laughs> but I, any, any, any gardening talk, I fit it in somewhere. I got it from Dr. Elaine Ingham. I got it in 1997 at the Echo Farm Conference, which utterly changed my life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Utterly changed every way that I think about growing. And she talked about the fact that somebody was trying to track how many times a nitrogen molecule is exchanged in the soil in a given minute. And so they took a cubic centimeter of soil, about a tablespoon, right? And they took a nitrogen molecule and they made it, they you know, t labeled it. it with radioactive, with the radioactive, what was it? I, I said tagged it. but Yeah, tagged yeah. it radioactively. With an isotope, whatever. And then they tracked it. And in one minute, that, that isotope was exchanged 1,100 times. Somebody wow. ate somebody, somebody pooped that out, somebody ate the poop, somebody was born, somebody times? died, 1,100. One per minute. Per minute. Per minute. Biological transformation of nitrogen. This is the suspended animation of food. It's why organic is ultimately has to be able to be more effective than conventional. Because conventional, you put the fertilizer down, it's water soluble. If it hits the roots on the way down, they get it. After that, it's gone. And yeah. it's high in salts. And it kills the life. So yeah. it's killing life as it's going down. We, my trials at Virginia Tech, one year he did a lot of fertigation and the yield went down. And I was like, it's got to be the salts. Like, what did salt. you do different? Yeah. Well, first, what did you do different? We found out it was more fertilizer. What was it? Conventional fertilizer was a high in salt. Yeah, after that many shots of fertigation, we were knocking the biology back. So instead, you have this 1,100 exchanges a minute. That's just for nitrogen, right? This incredible food stabilizing system, right? For conventional fertilizers either move down or gas off, right? They don't stay in the root zone. Marshall did a lot of conventional tomatoes. He tried to, full, to, to inject in his system over 12 hours so that the food was there for a long time. Very smart. Better yet, we've been to inject with compost tea. Because then, the food's all right there. And the plants get it in the form they like best, right? Which is the poop of microbes. That is the, the form they like it best. And it doesn't matter really to the plant, if, it ha if the microbes haven't been killed by the conventional fertilizers, I won't argue, the plant's gonna love that poop, whether it ate conventional fertilizer or it ate compost. The problem is, 
a whole bunch of those microbes died when the conventional fertilizer got put in there. Really savvy conventional growers are learning to use way less fertilizer with compost. And it goes way further on with compost tea. And low salt fertilizer. Low salt fertilizer. We're up to 8% yeah. nitrogen liquid organic you can get now. And I think 14% granular, somebody told me the other day, they, they found a 14% organic granular fertilizer. So you can have a good kick and still have it be organic. So that's the kick we do to the tank mix, right? We put those foods in the tank mix. Why I started to tell you, what got me at that point to tell that, was right now is the time to feed your garlic. Between now and early May, the more you feed it, the bigger your garlic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about getting big leaves, big tops, that's big garlic. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna feed twice a week to be sure the garlic's big. We also love beets, have a whole lot of beets out. We've got real big problems with Cercospora, the red spots on beets. We gotta get them to be nice and big and finished before it gets hot and humid. So likewise, they're gonna get hit with a big meal twice a week, you know. And so we're pushing those plants. Now, that's walking on the wild side, <laughs> especially for the, um, for the beets. Because if we get what could happen, folks, you know, I mean, there was a year, mid-April in CeeLo, it was 15 degrees. That happens and we're feeding them like that, we darn well better get row cover and plastic over them. Or they're dead. Because they've grown so fast, they've got too many water cells, and they're not going to be able to handle all that water, they're not going to get it out of their cells, and they're going to freeze and die. You know? So that, you know, you could do, you could, you could really push it with tea. And it'll, it'll do amazing things, but be aware that you might be sorry if you're not ready to deal with the consequences of a change in weather. You know? The other thing that um, John's research is showing and we're seeing here too is be ready for earlier fruiting when you use tea. We know that's happening pretty consistently. You know? And that is a plus basically, but actually we got caught with our pants down last year because we weren't ready to put our sidewalls up. There were still enough cool On nights. The greenhouse. Yeah, and we didn't have enough staff on hand to easily put them up. And we had a few days where it got way too hot in there. And they, if they were in the pre-fruiting stage, they wouldn't have missed a beat. They would have been wilty and they wouldn't have liked it, but they would have, if they're determined to make fruit, they would have kept going. Instead, we'd already had way more fruit than we expected that early, and that heat came and bam, they were all done. It just, it just took them out. They never came back from it. You know? So, and that's gonna, you know, that happens if this time of year, if, you, if your plants start coming in, then you're going to have to be able to have tweaking your ventilation better than you usually do. You know? So you, you know, it's positive. I mean, for growers, it's very positive to get tomatoes in early. That's when the market pays well. For home growers, I mean, who who wants a late tomato sandwich, right? You want the tomato sandwich as early as you can get it, you know? So it's great that that happens, but know that you have to then be used to what the effects of that are. You know? uh, I think that covers pretty much. Yeah. Now, uh, okay, so segue.